he and I were walking next to each other when the band went on stage. And for small talk, I said, what do you want to do for a slow song? And he said, do you know tomorrow's a long time? I said, yeah. He said, let's do that, just you and me and maybe Mike. And so when the time came, he started playing Tomorrow's a Long Time with just me and Mike. It was Gothenburg, Sweden, and it was 20,000 people, and it was terrific. And we had never played it with him before, or with each other. It was transcendent. I remember, I remember one, of the, one of the Saturdays, this is Saturday nights, he was there. He started to sing this song, Where Have You Been, Young Jimmy, My Son? And, and I thought, oh, he's going to sing. Oh, he's got, I wonder what, what version of, of Lord Randall he's going to sing. And it very quickly became clear that this wasn't Lord Randall at all. This was, uh, you know, this was Hard Rains Are Going to Fall. And, and I mean, he, he was spellbinding. You know, he sang that song. And when he'd finished, there was that moment of quiet when, when the audience just, Take in what they've just been, what what they've been given. I I I love it when an audience when, when an audience does that. They just wait for us just a, a couple of seconds longer, and then the, the applause started and it and it went on for a long time. People like people like that song. They've been given something extraordinary, something very very new. I guess it would be one more cup of coffee. I liked it. I loved the story and I love the gypsy atmosphere of it and the, the mysticism of it um, and the kind of uh, very sinewy, um, the interplay between the violin and the harmonica. I loved all of it. Did you feel like the Desire songs evolved, you know, over the course of the tour? They absolutely did. They did. They, um, they did. I mean, they changed. Some of them didn't change, like Oh Sister or Sarah didn't change. I mean, they kind of stayed in the same tempo and the same pretty true to the sound of the album. But um, things like Isis just went through the roof live and became a fiery, you know, fast, furious, complete different version, which I thought were, was fantastic live. I remember one night they were doing Knocking on Heaven's Door and I was by the side of the stage, and I just said, you know what, this could really use drums. So my mics were on, and I snuck up to the drums, and at the chorus, you know, did this gigantic fill, uh, going into the chorus, a gigantic fill, and uh, Bob turned around and smiled. It was a nice moment. And then, I don't know, if, I think that was just one night, you know? That just happened one night. He liked it that night, but I didn't. I didn't do it the next night, or you know, subsequent concerts where they played knocking. He didn't like that. You know, if anything sounded predictable to him, or he could tell, you know, we were uh, phoning it in, <laughs> he would change it. He wanted to do an emblem man. I said, I said, I said, you don't know the words to that, do you? And he said. I know all the words to Ramblin' Man. I should have wrote that song myself. So we sang Ramblin' Man, and he sang every word exactly the way I wrote it. I mean, he knew it, in, and he sang it better than it's ever been sang before. I'm on my way down to New Orleans this morning. You know, he would just kind of talk it and sing it at the same time. I'm on my way down to New Orleans this morning. I'm leaving out of Nashville. I, I think my favorite song is one I didn't play on. <laughs> it, it was the way they did Tangled Up in Blue. I, I thought that was unbelievable. It, uh, I, I used to, I, I, I had goosebumps every time he did it. It was just Bob and Steve and, 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 and Alan. And uh, it was just, it was, it was remarkable. It was, uh, he something comes. I mean, he's he always sounds best when there is the least amount of music behind him, in some ways because he he's just he has so much power. He's such an unbelievably great singer that I don't need a lot to to listen to Bob. You know, it's it's, it's hearing him by himself sometimes is like even more powerful than hearing him with a band. It's uh... he came back about a month later uh, from working a chess club in New Jersey. And asked if he'd go on, and I recognized him. I said, "Sure," you know, knowing ostensibly what kind of music he was going to do. 
So I segued it in between a classical or a uh, flamenco guitar player, I think, and my own comedy routine. And and he got on stage and he began to do. I don't know what your folk background is, but there is a song uh, called Buffalo Skinners. And it tells the story of a man who gets a job, you know, hard times. Uh, he's out west. He gets a job uh, working for a group of people skinning buffalo hides. And uh, at the end of the season, he wants to move on. And so he goes to payroll and they pay him in buffalo skins. And he says, well, what am I supposed to do with these? And the guy says, I'll just take him to the general store and trade him off. So, you know, he does. He goes, as the folk song goes, he goes to the general store and he gets supplies for his trip further west. Well, Dylan starts singing this song that has those same chords. Only this is a story about a guy who works at a chess club in New Jersey. And he's, and he's a folk singer singing in New Jersey. And at the end of the gig, um, the proprietor pays him in chess pieces. And uh, Dylan says, well, what am I supposed to do with these? And he says, you know, just take them to the bartender. Uh, you know, they're just, just like currency. So Dylan goes, sits at the bar, orders a beer, pays with a king and gets two rooks and change. That blew my mind. Uh, you know, I mean, in retrospect, it doesn't seem like it was that staggering. But in that one encapsulated moment, it became uh, and in retrospect, it is obvious to me that Dylan had a sense of what folk music was, that it that its its reach was much broader than the specific story. I can't remember. I, I think somebody told me about it, or, or I think I read it on Facebook or something. You, you know, someone commented about it, and um, and I thought, well, I don't really believe that. You know. <laughs> Why would uh, Bob, you know, uh, get, get cover us on a mine? But you know, um, when it sank in, I thought, well, that's fantastic. You know, I, I, I've covered, you know, seventy-five of his. Uh, he's covered what one of mine. I think that that's the right ratio. Um, and then when we were in Italy one night, I remember I really heard Bob Dylan, like I heard him. And then we'd probably been on the road a year. I didn't even know. And I just, I was sitting there at the drum store. I didn't leave when he did his solo stuff, which I usually like, well, if I'm not involved, I'll leave, you know, but I sat behind the kit and I smoked a cigarette and I watched this man. And I'm, I'm only doing this dramatically because this is what went through my mind. There's five super troopers just right on Bob Dylan. It's one guy, one guitar, and he's singing blowing in the wind and he's singing, I forget what, uh, three or four other songs. And I literally, I, I melted. I, I cried. I started to, to actually weep like, and um, cause it hit me in that one fucking moment. Finally, like this guy wrote all this stuff and it's all incredibly good. And he's doing it tonight. Like it's, it's coming out of, it's pouring out of him like sweat. You know, it's, it's, it's effort. It feels effortless, but he's, it's it's killing me, and every line ripped me to shreds. I actually remember walking up to Bob at the end of that show while he was we were all still sweaty, and I think I put my hands on his shoulders and I said something like, "You know, you really you really fucked me up tonight. That was you know extraordinary what I saw." And I remember his perfect reaction. He looked at me with that billion dollar look, and he said in that voice, "Stan, are you all right?" Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the poet laureate of rock and roll, the voice of the promise of the 60s counterculture, the guy who first folk into bed with rock, who donned to make him in the 70s and disappeared into a haze of substance abuse, who emerged to find Jesus, who was written off as a has-been by the end of the 80s, and who suddenly shifted gears, releasing some of the strongest music of his career beginning in the late 90s. Columbia recording artist, Bob Dylan. <laughs> 